I'm Gordon Earle. Thanks for joining us. Today we're talking about newborn infants and what is being done to help them and possibly save their lives when they're born prematurely. One of the leading experts in this field is Dr. Judy Ashner. She's professor and Michael I. Cohen University Chair of Pediatrics at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Physician-in-Chief and Chair of Pediatrics at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. Judy, thanks for your time. Thank you. Judy, you came to Einstein from Vanderbilt. Your husband worked there. Mm -hmm. Your children went to university there with sure. obviously very deep connections. <laughs> so the question is, why did you move to Einstein? Moving to Vanderbilt in 2004 was an enormous opportunity for me. Um, I became chief of the division of neonatology and I was able to build a um, robust nationally recognized program there. And honestly, in the nine years I was there, I more than accomplished all of my goals that I had set out when I moved there. And I was ready for the next opportunity, the next challenge, and mostly an opportunity to make a difference on a bigger scale. I found here a leadership that um, truly has a commitment to pediatrics and a culture, an institutional culture that really resonated with me. And so I am beyond excited about the opportunities that we face. Did coming to the Bronx make a difference, into New York? Is this, is this a market in which you wanted to do research and, and practice uh, your clinical work? So as you know, I was born in upstate New York, but I have never lived in the city before. As a matter of fact, Nashville was the biggest city I ever lived in until April when I moved to the Bronx. But in many respects, it was the population that is served here that really drew me here. Um, I saw the um, chance to really do something impactful and meaningful. And if we can make a difference here in the Bronx, we can make a difference throughout the United States and throughout the world. Let me step back for a second because there was a, st a statistic I want to uh, run by you that one in eight children are born prematurely in America is like 500,000 children annually and that, that figure surprised me. Is, is that accurate? It is very accurate. So the data are that 15 million children worldwide are born prematurely and more than a million children throughout the world die from complications of prematurity. In the United States, the rates of preterm birth are very high. Not all that different from many developing countries. About 12% of, of children born in the United States are born prematurely. Is it a more significant medical issue than is generally given credence? Because that number surprised me. It wouldn't surprise those in the profession. But I'm wondering if it's an under-recognized medical issue. It is an under-recognized medical issue, even for the profession. So um, there was a very cavalier attitude towards the birth of children in that late preterm category of 34 to 36 weeks. With the advances in neonatal intensive care, most of those children survive and go home. And people had not thought that it represented a huge risk. But research over the last uh, five years or so have demonstrated that being born even a week before 39 weeks gestation with full term being 40 weeks is associated with increased morbidity and increased problems later on, um, school age problems including learning disabilities. Children who are born even at 36, 37, 38 weeks, which technically beyond 37 weeks isn't considered preterm, are more likely to have lifelong health problems. And so um, I think there is a growing understanding, both among the profession and among the lay public, that um, there's a reason why Mother Nature intended gestation to last 40 weeks, and um, doing anything to um, electively deliver an infant um, prematurely has its potential consequences. Have those numbers changed over the years? Put that in a historical perspective. Sure. So the rate of preterm birth in the United States relentlessly rose from 1990 to 2006. Every year the statistics worse than the year before. We seem to be on a trajectory in the wrong direction. A lot of effort was applied around 2004, 2006, particularly recognizing the problem with the late preterm infants born between 34 and 36 weeks gestation, and a lot of effort uh, aimed at the community, at um, obstetricians, to avoid elective births 
scheduled deliveries before 39 weeks. And the curve is starting to change. So for the first time in decades since 2006, we're starting to see a slow decline in the rate of preterm birth in the United States. And if you had to put uh, the major reason for that, it would be what? I think it's actually changes in obstetrical practices um, and understanding that delivering a baby, if there's no medical indication before the spontaneous onset of labor or before 39 weeks, uh, has risks associated with it. Before, when I started reading into the subject, I was thinking about your research and the causes and whatnot, um, but I was struck by the fact that you refer um, to premature birth as a social and public health mm. issue, which means you're looking at the health of the mother either before or during pregnancy. Could you tell me a little bit more about yeah. that? So you can't expect to have healthy babies born unless you have healthy pregnant women. And the health of a woman during pregnancy is related to her pre-pregnancy health. And unfortunately, we do not have uh, a healthy um, childbearing age um, population in many parts of the United States. And so preterm birth is a multifactorial problem. There are um, numerous risk factors for delivering prematurely. Very young women and older mothers are more likely to deliver preterm. Multiple gestation, um, having a pregnancy with twins or triplets. And so reproductive technology actually has contributed to the increased rates of preterm birth in the last couple of decades. But maternal health is a big factor. Um, and so risk factors including smoking, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, all of these problems which are very prevalent among young women, particularly in the Bronx, uh, increase the likelihood of delivering prematurely. And then poverty, not having a college education, being single, these are also factors that are associated with an increased risk of delivering prematurely. I wonder if we just look down the road though, those factors that you mentioned, if there's any sense that there'll be improvement down the road. We still have rampant poverty and we still have lots of issues with uh, with, with how we eat and obesity. I'm just wondering if you're optimistic or, or not when you look at the public health aspects of yeah. what you do. So I am the eternal optimist, and especially since 2006, we've been beginning to see that curve bend a bit. But um, the um, attack on preterm birth really needs to be multifactorial. We need to address women's health. We need to address some of the societal issues around access to care. We need to address the epidemic of obesity. We need to get women into good preventative health care so that we can manage problems related to diabetes and hypertension. And we need our public officials um, to work together with us to implement policies that are going to address all these factors. Okay, let's look at the research side of, of yeah. things a little bit. Now, I know that you do research in many things, but pulmonary hypertension is a specific area and such a devastating condition for premature infants to have to experience. So what progress has been made in that area over the last couple of years? So pulmonary hypertension, which is high blood pressure in the lungs, um, is a problem that most people think about as occurring mostly in full-term infants, interestingly. So before you're born, when you're still a healthy fetus in utero, the blood pressure in the lungs is very high because the lungs don't have to do anything before you're born. And so the heart pumps most of the blood right to left, avoiding the lungs to the placenta, which is the gas exchange organ um, for the fetus. At the moment of birth, when the obstetrician cuts the umbilical cord, the blood pressure in the lungs has to fall dramatically because there needs to be an eight to tenfold increase in blood flow to the lungs for that infant to be able to do normal gas exchange and survive without a placenta. That process doesn't always go well. Infants who have infections or anomalies of their lung or certain types of heart disease often fail to have that dramatic fall in what we call pulmonary vascular resistance. And when that happens, the baby has pulmonary hypertension and it can be devastating. And when I was in training, when I was a young physician, there were not good therapies, and many of these infants died. Several decades ago, the FDA approved inhaled nitric oxide, a wonderful example of bench-to-bedside translational research 
that has really transformed the field of neonatology. Pulmonary hypertension was associated with devastating outcomes before the uh, introduction of inhaled nitric oxide. And today, this drug really um, has saved lives and reduced the need for very invasive therapies like extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, a kind of heart-lung bypass machine that is sometimes used to save the lives of, of term infants with pulmonary hypertension. So my early career was really focused on the signaling mechanisms that control pulmonary vascular tone and blood pressure in the lungs of uh, newborns. Um, understanding those signaling mechanisms was what allowed us to understand that nitric oxide was an important endogenous signal that helps reduce um, blood pressure in the lungs when infants transition normally. And the randomized controlled trial showing efficacy of inhaled nitric oxide, as I said, really changed the field. But pulmonary hypertension is not limited to full-term infants. And it turns out that many premature infants, particularly those with chronic lung disease, can develop a form of pulmonary hypertension that is devastating. The mechanisms are somewhat different than in the full-term infant, and the therapies need to be different. And although inhaled nitric oxide is sometimes used to treat these infants, there is really not strong evidence to suggest that um, it is effective and I think other strategies are needed. So my research over the last 10 years has really shifted towards better understanding the signals and um, factors that are related to the development of chronic progressive pulmonary hypertension in very premature infants with evolving um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease. Another aspect of your research, and you can tell me how important it is, is this research into biomarkers that predict which premature infants will be susceptible down the road to severe lung infection and perhaps morbidity. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I think it's really an important area for research, and I currently have an NIH-funded U01 grant looking at biomarkers related to lung growth and development and bronchopulmonary dysplasia in premature infants. There's a lot of talk these days about personalized medicine, and in some aspects it's starting to come in the adult world of medicine, um, but the world of neonatology has not really gotten there yet. And so exposing an infant to a therapy that may or may not be part of the causal pathway in their disease is fraught with a lot of risk. And so if we could identify early biomarkers that not only identified which infants are at the greatest risk of developing chronic lung disease that will result in long-term respiratory morbidity, but also biomarkers that identify which pathways are important in that particular infant's trajectory to lung disease or lung health, then we can better target our therapies and give the right medicine to the right baby at the right time. We're not there yet, but I think some of this research in biomarkers um, will help get us there. Judy, with that overview of your research, I want to go back on the personal side, which is why you entered this field. And, and the reason I want to uh, mention it is you're talking about, you know, very sick, traumatized infants and families too. This is a difficult situation. And yet, when you experienced it in your training, you said, that's what I want to do. And I'm, on, I'm curious why difficult but incredibly rewarding. So I was one of those people that loved whatever rotation I was on. I loved surgery because I, I liked doing procedures. I liked all aspects of medicine and was struggling with what I wanted to do. And then I walked into that neonatal intensive care unit and realized that it combined everything that I loved. So neonatologists are in some respects generalists for newborns. You don't have to limit your focus to a single organ system or a single subspecialty because we take care of infants with heart disease and lung disease and gastrointestinal diseases and infections and brain injury and congenital anomalies. We take care of infants who require surgery and there are actually a lot of procedures that go on in neonatology. And so it truly combined all of my interests and focused on newborns. And honestly, I've always been in love with newborns. And so it didn't take me very long to realize that I 
was going to um, thrive in that environment. I always feel like people are successful when they do something that they love. And I love taking care of critically ill newborns, getting to know their families. Um, intensive care is different than um, uh, ambulatory care. I like the intensity of intensive care, but I also like establishing relationships with families. Premature babies often spend months in neonatal intensive care, and so the opportunity to build those relationships, to become part of that child's life, that story, um, and develop a trusting relationship with families is also an incredibly rewarding aspect. Looking back, uh, I know I made the right choice for me. I now, as chair of the Department of Pediatrics, have a much wider focus than just neonatology, but um, from a, the standpoint of my own practice of medicine, um, it was a perfect match for me. What struck me, and I hope you don't mind me bringing it up here, is your personal story. If you wouldn't mind telling me that story, because it is so incredibly powerful, given your own work. So I do have four children, and um, this was my third child who had the complicated pregnancy and the preterm birth. By that time, I was already um, a third year fellow in neonatology, so I'd already chosen neonatology as my career path. I had two healthy term infants, was not expecting to have this complication, but um, I ruptured membranes at really what even today, this was 1987, would be um, uh, a point before viability. I ruptured membranes at 21 weeks gestation. Typically, um, after premature rupture of membranes, women deliver within days to a week. And so we did not expect to have a, a viable child from that pregnancy. By some miracle, truly, um, and 10 weeks of bed rest later, um, I was able to carry that pregnancy to 31 weeks. I nonetheless delivered a premature, critically ill um, baby who required many weeks of neonatal intensive care, who had significant lung disease, who was the beneficiary of basic research translated to the bedside in the form of surfactant replacement therapy, not yet approved by the FDA when he was born, but um, available in the institution where I was working as a on a research protocol. And if it weren't for those four doses of surfactant, I doubt he would have survived. Mm. Um, he went home with significant uh, lung disease and pulmonary hypertension. Yes, there, there is a connection there. Needed oxygen at home for a period of time, but we were incredibly fortunate. We were in a excellent academic center um, and very lucky in that regard. And he's today um, a healthy but stubborn 26-year-old um, <laughs> uh, who just finished law school and um, is well. It, it brings me to another subject which is your strong belief in family-centered care because obviously you and your young family and your husband were all involved in, in that luckily an episode that turned out to be very well but on the family-centered care you're a strong believer that families be completely informed, as I understand it, of um, the treatment and the consequences of that treatment. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and I think my own personal experience of being on the other side of the, of the um, bedside um, has definitely influenced my philosophy and my approach to family involvement in care. And it, it's not restricted to neonatology, but all aspects of pediatric care. So I believe that um, families need to be integral members of the healthcare team. They need to know everything that's going on with their child. They need to be involved in decision making. Ultimately, they have the responsibility for caring for that uh, infant or child after discharge from the hospital. And they need to be as informed as we can possibly make them and empower them um, by providing information so they can make um, decisions that are best for their child and best for their family. And I would imagine that there's some, those are the most gut-wrenching decisions a family could make in terms of care or perhaps even deciding that uh, there is not viability there or the trauma to this young infant would be too extreme. 
So I've been fortunate to live through an incredibly exciting time in neonatology. It's hard to even describe the advances in the field from the time that I was a resident and a fellow to today. It, the field doesn't resemble what it did um, back in the um, early and mid-1980s. So there are many, many infants who survive and do well and go home today who would not have survived when I was in training. But we still have infants born in, um, at a gestational age that is not compatible with survival. And we have older infants born with um, problems that are also um, not compatible with um, survival or good quality of life. And these are gut-wrenching decisions that um, families need to make in collaboration with the healthcare team, given as much information as possible about what the, the outcomes might be um, and what the options are. And I believe that um, the healthcare team's role is to support the family in whatever decision they make. Let me ask him one more personal note. Um, uh, it's again, part of your amazing story is that you were able to go through medical school and training, uh, get married and have four children. Yeah. Is that a realistic possibility for young women doctors today to have that expanded family with the pressures of medical school today? I tell young women, and there are many young women in pediatrics today, that they can indeed have it all. You just not might be able to have it all at one time. And so you need to think hard about your priorities in life. I call myself a late bloomer when it came to my scientific and research career. I practiced clinical neonatology for many years after my fellowship. I had four young children, and I really was not um, able to devote the kind of time and attention that it requires today to be a successful, independently funded investigator until my youngest child was going into kindergarten. And so um, I kind of did it in reverse. And many people come out of the starting block, um, write grants, and then as their children come along, find that that's tough. I actually was um, late in getting to the lab, had realized that there were a lot of questions that I was seeing every day at the bedside. And smart people didn't have the answers to my questions and eventually decided, you know what? I need to go to the bench and figure out these answers myself. And so I was um, probably close to 10 years out of fellowship before I got my first NIH grant funded. I, have, I was fortunate to have some March of Dimes funding, some American Heart and Lung Association funding, but I was probably 10 years out of training before my first NIH grant was funded. Supportive children and a supportive husband help. Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> essential. Well, Judy, thanks for your time. That was a very, very interesting interview. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story. I'm Gordon Earle. This is Einstein On. Thank you for joining us.